to serve on that. Now this morning, I am concluding this series on the life and uh, sort of the ministry of Jesus, specifically his miracles, specifically the miracles that took place on the Sea of Galilee. So we've talked about this idea of Sea of Miracles, and we've looked at different ones. Today we're going to conclude this series, and this morning is Cast. This morning is cast. We've talked about different ones, calm, chains, all these different things that Jesus did. But this final miracle is also the final uh, miracle that would happen in the life of Jesus. So just to remind you of where we're at, turn, if you will, to John chapter 21. John chapter 21, final chapter in the last gospel, which is John. Now, previously, all the other miracles happened before Jesus' death and resurrection. But this miracle takes place with the resurrected Christ. Jesus was betrayed, arrested, crucified, dead, buried, risen from the dead on the third day. And now this is an interaction that Jesus has with the disciples after he has been resurrected. So it's important to remember that. This is the resurrected Jesus. So John chapter 21 and verse 3 Simon Peter says to them, that is some of the other disciples. Simon Peter says to them, I'm going fishing. And they say to him, we are going with you also. And they went out and immediately got in the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Let's pray. Lord, I ask in the next few moments, you will speak to each of us. We want to learn from this wonderful miracle. Move in this place. Challenge and convict every person here. We love you. We worship you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Life is a journey. Life is a journey. Some, for some lives, that's more literal than for others. For myself, life has been a journey. But before I turned 18 years old, I had been on every inhabited continent of the world, which is some of the perks of being the son of a missionary. I have, I have paddled dugout canoes across rivers in West Africa, bounced around on, in trucks on roads that looked like they were carpet bombed. I have, I have I've traveled everywhere. But it's not just exotic international travel. In the span of five and a half years, me and my family moved from Florida to Oklahoma to Georgia, back to Oklahoma, back to Georgia. We did that many in five and a half years. At the end of that, Courtney was like, I don't want to move anywhere ever again. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that many times we rented four or five straight houses that we lived in. We rented them sight unseen. We didn't, we didn't visit them. We didn't look at them. We did nothing. We looked at pictures online. We sent money to the landlord and we showed up with our stuff and moved into a house. And I think we did it four straight times, four straight moves, moved into a house we had never laid eyes on before. So life, life is a journey. It's, 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 That's part of it for everybody, for all of us. In this final miracle that Jesus does on the Sea of Galilee at the end of his earthly life and ministry, Jesus gives Peter and through Peter all of us some remarkable insights and ideas on the journey of life. He is talking not only about our journey, but Jesus, with all of these miracles, is revealing who he is inside of our journey. And that's what's so important. All of these miracles that we've talked about really essentially reveal much more to us about who Jesus is than it's really about the miracle itself. So I want you to get where we're at and get the picture. Jesus has been resurrected, but you remember 
The resurrection is weird, right? He doesn't just show up to everybody all at the same time. He appears to Mary Magdalene. Then Peter and John go down to the grave. The grave's empty, but they don't see Jesus right away. Then Jesus walks through the walls and tells Simon to put his hands in his side. and in his, So it's, it's back and forth, and he, he appears to these guys on the road to Emmaus. So Peter says, I'm confused. I don't understand what's happening. I, Jesus is alive, but I just... It's, it's, we, it, it's weird. I mean, we've had 2,000 years to dissect it. He resurrected from the dead. Don't like run away from that or, or like gloss over it. He's resurrected from the dead. They pulled him down off the cross. They put him in a tomb. It's finished. It's over. And three days later, he's back from the dead. That's got to mess with your brain a little bit. So Peter says, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. This is fascinating. Peter goes back to the place where he first encountered Jesus. He says, I I don't know what's happened. I'm going back to the beginning. Fascinating enough, if you remember five or six weeks ago when we started this series, the first miracle that we talked about was the calling of Simon Peter through almost an identical miracle. He says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now he says, cast your nets over there and you'll catch something, and they do. It's the same miracle almost, and they pull this net up with all these fish in it. So that's what's happened. Peter doesn't know what to do, so he goes fishing. Look at John 21 and 7. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that, by the way, is how John refers to himself in his gospel. It's weird. For some reason, John didn't want to talk about himself in the third person. So he doesn't say John. He doesn't say me. He says the disciple whom Jesus loved. It feels like a subtle dig to everybody else in the group, but regardless. (laughs) He also records that he outraced Peter to the tomb, by the way. If you look back at uh, John chapter 20, he makes it clear that he was much faster than Peter was. He was like, I got to the tomb first, okay? So regardless. Verse 7, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John. So John says to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask Jesus, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. All right. In this moment, this initial encounter with Peter... Jesus has recreated the scene of Peter's betrayal in Caiaphas' courtyard. We won't read it, but on the night that Jesus is betrayed, you remember this, Peter follows him at a distance, and he hangs out in the courtyard while the high priest is interrogating Jesus. And in that description of of that event, it talks about a charcoal fire, a fire made of coals. It's the only other place, other than what we just read, where a fire is recorded as being a charcoal fire. So it is the same fire, the same moment. So now, Peter betrays him, Jesus is dead crucified, buried, then he's resurrected from the dead, but Peter has never had this opportunity or this moment to interact with Jesus since his betrayal. He betrays Jesus in in a courtyard in front of a fire, and now they go fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and they drag all these fish, they catch all these fish in the net, and Peter wants to get get to Jesus first, so he jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. He walks up to the fire. It's early morning. It's cold. He's dripping wet. What is your natural inclination with any fire anywhere? You walk up to it and do like that. That is the natural inclination of any human in (laughs) finding, encountering a fire. And Peter, dripping wet, walks up to the fire and puts his hands up to it. And he looks across that charcoal fire and him and Jesus' eyes meet. And immediately, Peter is, is, is trans sort of taken back in time to that moment of betrayal. He remembers what he did. Jesus recreates the scene. But, listen to me, 
Jesus does not recreate the scene to heap condemnation on Peter. He recreates the scene so that Peter can be restored to ministry. Jesus offers restoration for our past. In the journey that is life, everybody's going to screw up. We're all going to sin. We're all going to backslide. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to cause pain. We're all going to have pain caused to us. Everybody in here has got a past. Some more elaborate than others. But what Jesus offers for our past is not condemnation, but restoration. That is what Jesus, do you see in this moment? What what doesn't Jesus do? He never tells Peter, man, you really hurt me. Man, you betrayed me. I can't believe you did that. He doesn't call Peter out. Peter knows what he's done. It is not to say that Jesus or God is doesn't care about sin. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that once we have confessed our sins, it tells us that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So in that moment, Peter has confessed his sins. He knows what he did was wrong. He's living with huge levels of guilt and condemnation. And what Jesus doesn't do is heap more condemnation on his head. Recognize this fire? Does this look familiar? You remember when you betrayed me? Remember how that, remember how I was going and you just left me and you didn't go to the cross with me and you abandoned me? Remember all of this, right? Here's what Jesus also doesn't do. You ever spent any time with someone who's not mad at you? If you've been married more than 10 minutes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? You ever had your spouse be not mad? Not mad spouse is worse than mad spouse. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? (laughs) Courtney's is all passive aggressive movements, right? She she vacuums the carpet like she's doing bayonet practice. (laughs) Right? I can hear. I'm like, man, she doesn't sound not mad to me, you know? Or washing dishes real mad, clanking everything. I do the exact opposite. I'm super quiet. Are you mad? No. Are you mad? No. I said I wasn't mad. I'm not mad. I don't want to talk about it. I do it. Right? So Peter comes up to the fire and he says, Jesus, are you mad? Jesus goes, no. It feels like you're mad, Jesus. No, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I was thinking about how you betrayed me, but I'm not mad. Right? Jesus doesn't do any of that. Because Jesus, he never offers condemnation always, even to the woman caught in the very act of adultery. He says, neither, neither do I condemn you. Now, go your way and sin no more. He says, I don't condemn you, but you need to experience life change. Go your way and sin no more. He is calling Peter. He is restoring Peter back into ministry. In just a few weeks from this moment, Peter will preach the sermon on the day of Pentecost and thousands will be saved. But Peter cannot participate in the day of Pentecost sermon if he does not have this moment of restoration on the beach. And that is what Jesus offers. Jesus says, have you made mistakes? Yes, we've screwed up. We've made lots of mistakes. And Jesus says, come here, find restoration. Have some breakfast. I made you some toast. I made you some fish. Have come be with me. Be restored. Now the second thing with this idea of restoration that I want to just give you real quickly. What's the only way that Peter misses out on the restoration? If he stays in the boat. If you stay in the boat, you don't find restoration on the beach. That's really, really important. So many of us tell ourselves the lie that, okay, everybody else in here can be restored, but they don't know what I've done. They don't know what my past is. They don't know what my sin is. So we, Jesus doesn't condemn us, but we condemn ourselves and stay in the boat. Have you heard people say, well, I know God can forgive me, but I just can't forgive myself. That's crazy. God's the creator of the universe. He is the one against whom the sin has been committed. And if he can forgive you, then you can find forgiveness. Allow yourself to be restored. Most of you, because we're a very uh, college football type of church. So most of you were probably watching Alabama and Tennessee. If you say, I don't know college football and I wasn't watching the game, it doesn't matter. I'm explaining it to you in about 10 seconds. (laughs) So... Most of you are watching, what a great game. I mean, that was an unbelievable college football game yesterday, mainly because Alabama lost. That was why it was really, really, really good. Yes. So, 
Those of you who weren't watching, Tennessee kicks a last-minute field goal to win the game, and the student section runs onto the field, and they set off fireworks, and it's this pandemonium, mainly because it had been 15 years since Tennessee had beaten Alabama. 15 years that they had gone losing, losing, losing year after year, decade, decade and a half, and then finally last night, and I'm not a fan of either team, but finally last night, gloriously, <laughs> right? They finally beat the dreaded Saban, okay? So, they, and they kick the field goal and they do, right? Did you see the kids? They, take, they, they, they pull the, um, the goalpost up, right? They took the goalpost out of the stadium. Did you see the news though? They take it out of the stadium, down the road, through campus, to the Tennessee River, and they throw the goalpost in the river. That's a true story. I, I, I lost the symbolism of that. I'm not sure exactly what was happening, but they throw their own goalposts into the Tennessee River. Now it's pandemonium. Everybody's celebrating. Everybody's happy. Everybody's excited. You know what I didn't see a single Tennessee player say? You know what I didn't see a single Tennessee fan talk about? The 15 years of losing. Because all of that is swallowed up in that one glorious moment of victory. Do you see, that is what God is saying to us. We say, he says, here's the victory, here's your triumph, and what we want to do is go back to the past and receive condemnation. Well, yes, we won this time, but they beat us for 15 years in a row. That is not what God is calling us to be about. Receive your victory, receive your triumph, receive your restoration. You are not under the condemnation of the past. Jesus restores you. He calls you to new ministry, new purpose, new destiny. The only way you miss it is if you sit in the boat and condemn yourself. Get out of the boat. Get on the beach and receive his restoration. Now, Jesus is not finished. Go back to where we were. Verse 15. Same chapter. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In this moment on the beach, now Peter has experienced restoration from his past, and now Jesus lays out instructions for how to move forward. Uh, I've heard some people say, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I just don't believe it's what Jesus is doing. I've heard some people say that Jesus repeats the question three times because Peter denied Jesus three times. And so he's allowing Peter to, but that's already, in my opinion, that's already happened around the fire. That's the, that's the moment of restoration. I don't, believe that he, I don't believe that he repeated the question three times to mimic the night of betrayal. I think that he repeated the question three times because while it is extremely simple, it is also extremely complex. Because I've spent some time with sheep, and sheep are not so much fun all the time, <laughs> right? Sometimes sheep like to butt you with their heads. Sometimes sheep bite you. Sometimes sheep do all kinds of things, and I'm a sheep too, and I do lots of dumb stuff as well. I think that the reason that he repeated it is so that Peter would do it and remember it, just like all of us. So the next thing is this. Jesus gives guidance for our journey. The guidance that he gave to Peter in that moment is the same guidance for all of us. Now, our journey is going to be unique, but our instructions are the same. And the instructions are, if you love Jesus, love everybody else. If you love Jesus, love everybody else. But see, that sounds simple, but when you actually try to do it, it becomes exponentially more complicated. You remember when you used to have to stop for directions before the age of cell phones? And you pull into some gas station in South Georgia, and there's an old guy sitting out there with a cowboy hat on? Old guys love to sit outside. I don't know why. When I'm old, I guess I'll understand it. But old guys love to sit outside. You ever done that? Drive by a bunch of houses. Old guys always sitting on the porch. I don't know what's happening inside the house, but nothing good, apparently. Get out on the porch. 
Old, old guys love to sit on the porch. It's true. It's not a bad thing. I just don't understand it. I'm not at that point yet, but I will be one day. I'll be old sitting on the porch. Slow down, right? So <laughs> that's what happens. So old guys sitting outside the gas station. You say, hey, I'm lost in South Georgia. Can you give me instructions, uh, directions? Can you tell me how to get back to the interstate? And he says, oh yeah, it's easy. He said, pull out of here and you go up, go one, through one stop sign. When you see a red barn, turn right after the red barn. You're going to go down a couple of miles and you're going to see a yard sale. That yard sale is always there. So just get, boy, when you get to that yard sale, don't turn on the first road after the yard sale, but the second road, turn left and that'll take you to the interstate. Got it. Red barn, right right, yard sale, left, interstate. Got it. Thank you. You start going, you go through the stop sign and then you see a barn, but it's not exactly red, (laughs) right? And it kind of looks red. And you think to yourself, was it red when he was a little boy and they painted it? So in his mind, it's still a red barn. Should I turn right here? Should I not turn right here? What should I do? Should I keep going until I see a pristine red barn? That's obvious. Is this the barn? Is it isn't? Do you see the directions that were so simple in the parking lot of the gas station become very complicated when you're trying to actually walk them out? And so Peter says, feed my sheep, or Jesus says, feed my sheep. And Peter says, that's easy. And then he starts trying to feed some sheep. And he says, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. You know what? Jesus probably didn't mean that. I mean, he meant it a little bit and I fed a couple of sheep. That's the reason I believe that he repeats it three times is so we take ownership of it, so we remember it, so we don't forget it, so we hold on to it. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? Do you love me? If you love me, love everybody else. And see, when you love everybody else, you find that they are somewhat unlovable. And I got news for you. Everybody else is thinking the same thing about you, (laughs) right? You think, oh man, all these people are really unlovable and all those people are thinking how unlovable you are. That's how it works. But that's what our call is. Your specific journey may be, is unique to you, but the overall instructions are the same for all of us. As we love Jesus, love everybody else. So Jesus gives us guidance for the journey, but he's still not done. Look, if you will, at John chapter 21. And verse 18, Jesus gives Peter no um, transition whatsoever. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Then Jesus says, great, let me tell you how you're going to (laughs) die. Like, you know, work on your transitions a little bit, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) That's literally what happens. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. All right. Let's talk about your death. Verse 18, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when Jesus had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Then Peter turning saw John. It's his description, but he saw John. Verse 21, and Peter, seeing John, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I return, till I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. So he has this conversation. He restores Peter. They have breakfast. They laugh together over the fire. He finds restoration in the presence of his Messiah. Then Jesus says, do you love me? If you love me, you got to love everybody else. And he repeats it once. And then again, three times, do you love me? You got to love everybody else. And then he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, one day they're going to come and they're going to put you in cuffs and they're going to lead you away to be executed. Remember, Peter refused to be killed in the same manner as Jesus. So he's crucified upside down. He says, one day, Peter, the Romans are coming and they're going to tie your hands. And then you're going to take you to a cross that looked a lot like the cross I was on. And they're going to crucify you and you're going to die. But he says, you follow me. You follow me. This last thing that Jesus gives Peter rings true for all of us. And Jesus promises peace for the destination. Jesus promises peace for the destination. Most of us, 
the destination, all of us, nobody in this room is going to be crucified upside down. That's not the destination. But that last day, that final day, that end will come for all of us. And the awesome, amazing, wonderful thing to remember is just as Jesus has been with us in all the rest of the days, he will be with us in that final day. He offers us his peace, his comfort. You follow me. Follow me on the good days. Follow me on the great days. Follow me on the mountaintop, but follow me on the bad days. Follow me on the dark days. Follow me on the scary days. And follow me on the last day. The reason he provides peace is because he never leaves us. He will not forsake us or abandon us. David knew this. A thousand years before Jesus, David wrote the 23rd Psalm and he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What is that? Peace. He says, I will have peace in the valley of the shadow of death. How? For you are with me. For you are with me, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. A lot of people, when they talk about journey, they'll tell you two, one of two things. They'll say, it's not the destination, it's the journey. It doesn't really matter where you're going. The the, the thing is the destination itself. You take the road trip. You stop at the farmer's market. You go to the roadside tourist trap. It is the journey itself that is important. It's It's the journey. It's not really the destination. Other people will tell you, no, no, no. It's the destination, not the journey. It's where you're going. You're going to that exotic place you've never been. You're going to that place you've always dreamed about. The journey's difficult. The journey's long. The journey's not important. What's important is the destination. I can agree with that at times. When I'm flying to Thailand for 15 hours in economy, it ain't the journey. Trust me, it's the destination, right? Got your, my knees up under my chin for 15 hours eating a tiny piece of chicken on a fold-down tray. It's not the journey. It's the destination, So what one is it? It's not the destination, it's the journey. It's not the journey, it's the destination. They're both wrong. Listen to me. It's not the journey, it's not the destination, it's the company that you keep along the way. It's the company you keep along the way. And Jesus says, I will be with you always, the whole way. You follow me. As long as you're following Jesus, the destination isn't that important and neither is the journey. It's about the company that you keep. And Jesus says, Peter, it's going to get confusing. It's going to get scary. You're going to be persecuted. People are going to turn against you. But you're also going to see revival. And you're going to see people healed. And Peter is going to grab that lame man in front of the temple and pull him up. And he's he's going to be healed. You're going to see great stuff. You're going to see scary stuff. But in every moment along the journey, and when you reach the destination at the very end, you follow me. You follow me. As long as you follow Jesus, you will have peace on the journey and you will have peace on that final day. When the destination comes and none of us know when it comes or how it comes or where, what it will look like, but we can find comfort and peace in that final day as long as we are following him. So Jesus says, you follow me. You've been restored. You've been given instructions. And now you follow me. So let me close with this. In the 1950s, the scientific community made an interesting observation that nobody had ever realized before. Spain and Portugal, two countries in Europe, were fighting over their border. And the Portuguese government had the length of their border at a certain amount, length. Spain had the length of the border at a different amount. And there was a scientist named Lewis Richardson. And Lewis Richardson said, they're both measuring the same border. How can one person be measuring it longer than the other person? And Lewis Richardson invented a scientific observation known as the coastline paradox. This is fascinating, by the way. At least it is for me, so you're going to get it. (laughs) You may be sitting there going, this doesn't seem fascinating at all. So 
but for me it's fascinating. The coastline paradox, and it is this. You cannot accurately measure the coastline of any landmass in the world because depending on the length of your measurement, it makes the total length of the, of the coastline change. So here is Great Britain. That's the island of Great Britain, measured in 100 kilometer lengths. That's how long Great Britain is if you measure it in lengths of 100 kilometers, except you see all the little places that it misses? So here's the coastline of Great Britain in 50 kilometers. Guess what? That makes it a lot longer. And if you cut it in half again, which I don't have pictures of, but if you make it smaller in 25 kilometers and 10 kilometers and five kilometers and one kilometer, the shorter the measure of the length that you're measuring, the unit of measurement, the shorter the unit of measurement, the longer the total coastline becomes. So Lewis Richardson, because he's a scientist, said, I believe that if I get the unit of measurement as close to zero as possible, find a unit of measurement as small as possible, that he would have an exact fixed length. He said, I'm going to find a fixed length, and then we can measure all the coastline in the world because I'm going to make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and we'll have this tiny little measuring, and that will give us a fixed length. This is so cool. Lewis Richardson, as he made the unit of measurement smaller and smaller and smaller, and as it got closer and closer to being zero, you know what happened? He didn't get a fixed length. The coastline became infinite. The, the coastline became unmeasurable. Now that, that is a wonderful, wonderful metaphor of the grace of God in our life. See, some people will tell you there's only one work. How many works of grace are there? There's one work of grace. When you get salvation, some people tell you there's two works of grace, salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Some people tell you there's three works of grace. If you don't think people fight about this, you're wrong. Whole denominations have just been created out of the sentences I just said. It's true. One work of grace, two works of grace, three works of grace. You know how many works of grace there are? How many breaths have you taken today? How many times has your heart beat since you were born? Do you see the more you measure the number of works of grace in your life, the more you realize his grace is infinite. His grace is infinite. It's not one work. It's not two works. It's not five works. It's not 10 works. The more you break it down, every blessing, every way he's provided, every providential miracle, every breath, every heartbeat, everything he's done, everything he's done in the life of your kids and your spouse and your grandkids, you measure it and 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 you, it and you realize the grace of God is infinite beyond measure. That, that is what God is about. Do you see? We find restoration from our past because of the infinite grace of God. We find instruction and guidance for the journey. We can love others because of the infinite grace of God. And we can trust that God will give us peace and comfort. When we reach the destination, at the end, on that last day, we know that God will be with us and he will give us peace and comfort because of the same thing that sustained us on the entire journey, the infinite grace of God. The infinite grace of God. The more, <laughs> the more, the more you break it down, the more infinite his grace becomes. You, you can be restored because of grace. You can love others because of grace. And you can have peace and comfort in the worst moments because of grace. The grace of God, which passes all understanding. The grace of God, which is more infinite, more wonderful, more miraculous than anything we could ever think of or imagine. Jesus was making it clear to Peter on that beach and to all of us, follow me. You follow him, you experience his grace, and he will be with you 
every moment from this moment to the last moment. He will be with you and he will give you his grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace, which is infinite beyond measure, which cannot be counted or measured, which cannot be numbered. Your grace, your grace that restores us. God, I intercede right now for anyone in here struggling with their past. Receive God's restoration. He no longer condemns you, neither condemn yourself. Now, go your way and sin no more. Receive his restoration. The grace of God gives you restoration from your past. For those struggling with what to do on the journey, receive his grace. Allow his grace to help you love others on your journey. As you have loved Jesus, so love everybody else. And when you face the valleys, the darkness, the scary days, the terrible days, and the final day, receive his comfort and his peace. He will never leave you or forsake you. Follow him. And in every moment, you will receive his grace for your life. It's all grace. Grace for the past. Grace for the journey. Grace for the destination. Receive his grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here this morning. A couple of things as we go. The concert tonight, 5.30. We hope you'll be there. Pastor Tim is going to meet right over here if you're interested in the domestic mission trip. And the young professionals, young adults are going to lunch immediately following service at l and Burger in Monroe. If you're in your 20s or 30s, please join them for a hamburger. God bless you guys. Walk in grace. <laughs>